Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming. Thanks for joining. Like I said, we have more Fredonia people happening on now, so it's great. And uh, so, yeah, this is going to be a round table. <laughs> so, you know, Zoom, I'm sure everybody is, especially in the last few weeks, is familiar with Zoom. Um, I think I have it set that mics are muted when you join. That's just to eliminate any of the, you know, the extraneous background noise. But feel free to unmute yourself, turn on your video. And I, we want this to be a discussion. So, you know, and frankly, in terms of my audio stuff right now, I'm an instructor and I'm working on my personal projects, mixing an album for a band now. But like, as far as marketing myself and stuff like that, I'm probably one of the, the pers one of the people here who should shut up the most and let other people talk, really. <laughs> so, um, yeah. I guess I had like a little cheat sheet of maybe things to, to talk about, but it's behind my, my Zoom window, so. Yeah, so that's the purpose of the meeting is to chat, share strategies, share information, ask questions, get answers, that kind of thing. Um, Hopefully we can all learn from each other. And to the guys that just came on, I am recording it. I hope you're okay with that. If you're not, just let me know in the chat or you can email me at contact at record, or paul at recordingstudio.com. And if we repurpose this for any reason, post it online. If you don't want to be involved in that recording or the transcription or anything like that, that's no problem. Let us know and we will make just sure you're not there. Let me know so I can put pants on uh, when those parts. Oh, no, <laughs> no, pants are... are Forbidden. <laughs> All right. Yeah. <laughs> so, with that being said, does any first of all, I guess before we start, does anybody have any specific questions or topics they want to discuss or have, you know, addressed today? On my recording setup, there's a red button, and I and I for the life of me, I don't know if you guys know what the red button does. Think it's does it eject? Is that to, to get rid of the rude clients? Maybe, yeah. <laughs> Maybe, <laughs> yeah. I don't know. <laughs> uh, all right. Okay. Well, if nobody has anything, I don't know. I, I've never really led a roundtable discussion, so I'm gonna probably suck at it. But I will try my best. <laughs> and if anybody else has has the experience and feels confident that they could lead the discussion. I will totally defer to you. Well, Paul, um, you had number number four on your little yeah. agenda here, man. Um, or three, actually, started sharing challenges and wins. Like, now that everything's happened, you know, what's different? Nothing? Everything? Oh. You know what oh, I mean? Like, I got some challenges and wins for you. <laughs> yeah. Right? So, yeah, Frank, Let's I would love it, it if you start. And can you start by just telling us, everybody a little bit about what you do, what you do, your experience and that kind of thing first. Yeah. So I currently work at digital arts in New York. We're a full service facility. We've got video editing. We've got, uh, we have a, a 4k mixing theater, 4k projection screen, really great setup. We've got a bunch of smaller audio suites, with video editing, we've got color grading. So now we're all working remotely. Um, the confluence of things that came together in time for this pandemic for me personally are just insane because we just redid our basement, made it into a home studio for me for the purpose of my own podcasting. I spent the last five years producing Gilbert Gottfried's amazing colossal podcast. Um, I'm not doing that anymore. I'm actually working on my own with some other people. So I wanted to zhuzh up the space around me and be able to have guests come over and record <laughs> here. And that also led to me looking into Source Connect to have for home, which led to me wanting to get another Ethernet computer, a, a cable on my computer, because uh, the only Ethernet port I have is being used my, by my Avid Artist Control. So I had to work that out. I didn't have a web camera for this computer. I got one three weeks ago just because I wanted to teach some classes. Little did I know that all these little pieces of the puzzle were going to put together everything I need to do my job from home. So I'm mixing stereo and surround. I've got all my sound libraries. I've got Source Connect. I'm handling national spots from the comfort of my basement. In the first week of this, when we closed the studio doors by, by law, really, in New York, um, I happen to live in a town in New Jersey where there's a lot of actors, a lot of Broadway people, a lot of TV people. They're all clamoring for a place to record because not all of them have booths to record in. Uh, 
So I was set up and ready to go. So I fabricated a booth. I put a little booth together off to the side uh, just to deaden the room that I'm in so they had a better place to record. And I was source connecting people out all over the country all day, every day for the first week. And then as the pandemic really picked up speed, I said, okay, I don't feel comfortable having people over anymore. My family's upstairs. Even though I got a separate entrance on the side of the house, it's still, we're sharing a space and it, it didn't feel comfortable anymore. So a client reached out to me and said, hey, we've got this actor. Uh, I can say his name now because the spots are running. His name is Andre Brower. Uh, he's on Brooklyn Nine-Nine, a lot of stuff. Hello, he lives man. up the road. And they said, can he come to you and record? And I said, no, uh, I love Andre, but I'm not having people over. They said, well, can you go to him? And I said, I have everything I need to go to him, but I don't think he wants anybody in his house any more than I want people in my house. They said, well, what can we do? And sorry, Ken, Ken's heard this story a hundred times this week in all my other webinars I've been doing. <laughs> but um, I said, listen. Should I tell the story? Yeah, you probably, <laughs> know, you probably know it better than I do at this point. I'll, I'll correct you if you miss anything. Yeah, and, and Greg also. Greg's been, we've been hanging out in these webinars now. As I've been, a quick aside, I've been doing, every other night I've been doing webinars to groups of 40 or 50 voice actors helping them get set up for a home studio because that's the world we're in right now and not all of them are prepared, including the actor I'm talking about. So I remembered as I was talking to the client, you know, I did a job for Ikea last summer. The premise of the commercial was it's supposed to be a cab driver. He's got a Spanish accent. He's driving around Manhattan talking about how hard it is to, to get by and thank God for the new Ikea planning center in Manhattan, whatever, bullshit advertising. But he did a bunch of takes in the booth on a Sennheiser 416, which is the weapon of choice for a lot of voice studios these days. And it's either that or the 87. <clears throat> and we, I said, when we were done, I was like, you know, where do you have to be after this? And he said, I got to go up to like 57th Street. He said, great. So I took the writer and me and a portable rig and we jumped in a cab. And I had him do a bunch of takes sitting in the back of the cab with me holding the 416, the writer directing through the partition and it was good, but it was almost too good. When we got back to the studio and loaded it all in, compared to what we did, the client couldn't tell what was the booth and what was the cab. It was just because the 416 does such a good job at blocking out the background. Um, so with that in mind, I said to the client, here's what I propose. I've got a 416, have him in his car on the right side of his driveway, sitting in the back left seat. I pull up next to him in my car, kit it out with, I got to show you this tool. I love this thing. I reviewed this for ProSound News a while back, but it's the Road, Road, Roadcaster Pro, right? It's got four mic inputs, five headphones out. You got these little pads. You can have your podcast jingles and stuff on, um, five headphone outs, but it's got Bluetooth. So I was able to set this up Tonemeister style, like, like when Fred Stock <laughs> used to get recorded in Chris Murphy's van. Um, <laughs> in the back of my SUV, pulled up to his driveway. All I had to do is throw a power line into the side of his house to plug in my stuff. Uh, I didn't want to run it off an inverter in my car and have the car running, that defeated the purpose. I used my road as a talkback mic, ran, I put a baggie next to his car with my headphones and the, and the Sennheiser for him to open the door quickly, grab it, put it on his lap with the script, called the clients on my iPhone who were all on a conference call, Bluetooth them into this. So now in my car, I've got the agency and the production company listening in over Bluetooth. I'm talking to the actor in his car from my talkback mic. I got my stopwatch and my take sheets and we're just doing a session. I'm just sitting in the back of my car. And then when we were done, he got out of the car, went in the house. I retrieved the gear, got my new favorite thing to use. Oh, where did I put it? Here we go. The most important tool in a pandemic. Gave everything a good scrubbing down. <laughs> and then I put all that equipment in a bag for about a week, just tied it up and put it, you know, off in the corner, like not touching that gear for a week. And, um, and it worked. I came back, loaded it into Pro Tools. The clients were all on Zoom. I shared my Pro Tools screen, loaded all the takes in. They watched me edit to picture. They watched me mix. And then I sent them quick times for approval. And then a couple of days later, everything was approved. The spots are on air. And then I did it again the other day for another actor. But that time he pulled up to my house in his SUV, just drove alongside the studio door, 
ran the microphone and the headphones out to him, sat in the comfort of my basement, had him on Source Connect and got the job done. So those have been my two big fun stories during the pandemic so far. That's fantastic. <laughs> That's awesome. Man. I think there's a lot of Fredonia thinking that goes into making that kind of stuff work, you know, <laughs> troubleshooting and problem solving. Yeah. Hey, Frank, I have a question. Is that through your work or is that in, in, as an independent contractor? That's right now for my work. So okay. thankfully, you know, my, my job is still currently able to pay me. Obviously, the, the work has trickled down quite a bit and I had to take a salary cut to stay on um, because of the, the way the federal loans are all working. Um, you know, we had a, we, the cap at a certain point. So I've taken a cut, but, you know, I also have my night stuff that I do not as much these days, but I'm set up to work with other audiobook people and uh, voice actors. I've been teaching classes. I'm doing one tomorrow night. I've got about 50 people showing up um, for that. 80 people RSVP'd, but only 50 paid. So I'm going to say 50 people are attending that <laughs> class. Um, and so, you know, whatever I can to make up for it, you know. Yeah. That's so awesome. is, the is the class, the uh, thing you were talking about, um, teaching voiceover actors how to record from home? Yeah. Well, this is a modified version of that. So Source Connect, this, the company Source Elements uh, that makes Source Connect, got wind of what I was doing and reached out to me and said, look, you know, if there's any way we can help. And I, so I spent two hours talking to the one of the founders of Source Connect mm -hmm. about all the questions people have. And he answered them thoroughly and it was really eye-opening. Like there were ways to do things that I wasn't really hip to and just clever stuff and really explain things very clearly. So that helps me. And he said, you know, if you ever want to do one of these where I'm with you and I can answer everybody's questions directly, I'm like, Friday the 17th. But what's happened with these, I've been doing the webinars for free. But what happens is 80 people say they're going to come and 40 people show up. And I find that annoying because then invariably they reach out the next day and say, did you tape it? I couldn't get it. I couldn't do it. I'm like, no, this is really important stuff. <clears throat> you need to know. And I'm putting myself out to do this. And it doesn't bother me that you didn't come, but like you should really come. Um, and the same thing the other night, they did a little Tone Meister uh, thing for the Fredonia students. And like, what, Ken, what was like 10 people came or something, if that pretty poorly attended. And I just kind of felt like, You've got in, in the same room where a bunch of former tone meisters working in the business, giving you advice and you didn't tune in. That's, that's unfortunate. But anyway, so I decided to char charge um, because then if you're paying, you're probably going to show up. And it also separates the wheat from the chaff a little bit because you've got people attending these webinars that don't understand the basics of what we're talking about. And it drags the whole thing down when you get into Q&A. And it's unfortunate because there are people that are waiting with important questions and someone else is hung up on how to find a wave file on their computer. Um, and that's not to put them down. I just think there has to be separate classes for those folks, which I'm starting to do uh, basics. Uh, Teach them so, what the red button means. Ex literally, but literally that. <laughs> yeah. uh, and people pushing back when I'm telling them how something works. Like, well, no, no, I've been using GarageBand and it works this way. I'm like, Okay, I get that you use GarageBand, but I've been doing this for 30 years and I'm going to show you now by sharing my screen why you're wrong, you know? <laughs> um, but thank you for your input, uh, but politely. Yeah. So that's what I've been doing during the pandemic. The Dunning-Kruger effect in yeah. online audio communities is just like the bane of all of our existences. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let me tell you, I've got GarageBand. I'm, nobody's better than GarageBand than me. I'm the best... I have the biggest garage band. <laughs> uh, so back to some, something you were talking about. Can you tell us your experience with Source Connect and, you know, how you've been using it and, you know, how your experience has been with it? Yeah. Well, the first week I had it and I was the sender. So the actors were all coming here for whatever products and the actor would be here on the 87 or 416, sending them out in real time over Source Connect. Now that we flipped it, now the jobs I'm doing, like I'm doing one tomorrow, where the actor's in LA, I'll be receiving his voice in real time on Source Connect. The clients will all monitor over Zoom, like we're doing right now. You're hearing me on my mic through Pro Tools, through Loopback to Zoom. Um, and that's how the clients would monitor. Although Source Now is free and it allows stereo and pretty high quality, I'm considering switching over to that, but I'm not sure the clients will be hip enough to, we all get Zoom. I don't know if the clients are going to get Source now. 
but that's how it works. The, you know, now the, the actors are all set up and I've got my finger on the pulse of who's set up to work from home over Source Connect because I've been helping them all get there. So that allows me when I'm casting yeah. a session to say, this guy's great and he's got Source Connect, blah, blah, blah. And yeah. Now I receive the voice and I've got my sound libraries and music libraries and just make it. That's fantastic. Very cool. Yeah. And no need for ISDN. ISDN's dead, right? I mean, you really yeah. can't, you can't get it anymore. Somebody just reached out to me today through my website saying, hey, I'm selling a Zephyr. Oh, uh, my God. If you know anybody that wants <laughs> one. But honestly, but the, the, the people that do have ISDN and could use a Zephyr, like if, they're, if their machine's broken and they can buy a cheap replacement, well, sure, maybe you can sell it. But no one's installing ISDN lines right now. Um, and even the people that use IPDTL where they give you virtual ISDN lines, that's kind of a crapshoot. Uh, whether or not that's going to be stable or not. I think yeah. Source Connect is the clear winner here. And you've had great stability with that? You know? I've been using Source Connect for years. We've had, we have a license in every room at the studio. Okay. We spend a huge part of our day at Digital Arts sending people out for Disney, Nickelodeon. I've been doing ADR for features and Grey's Anatomy and other shows. Um, all Source Connect all the time. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Fantastic. I, I do have to interject. Uh, I have a friend who still works for EdNet. So they still exist. Yeah, they do. In San Francisco. Yeah, yeah we uh, do. I, um, Fox New, uh, Fox Sports uh, still connects over ISDN, mm -hmm. which is weird because they don't need to. <laughs> <laughs> Probably because they have the infrastructure and why change it? Yeah. I, I, I Yeah. I, I could go off, but I won't. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. No, I, I happen to work a, a bit in TV news um, when I'm not working on music. And... Uh, you, you know, when you get the infrastructure in place, you don't want to be changing that every couple of years just because, oh, there's something slightly better. Well, you know, something that's been working for us for five years, you know, you just push the button on the thing and it works. You know what? Why retrain, you know, 40 guys of varying in intellectual uh, abilities when you can just keep working with what, what you know works? Yeah, that makes sense. How do you find the quality you know, with ISDN versus, you know, Source Connect. I mean, my experience, and it's, it's been 10, 15 years, I, I was not happy with the ISDN quality, uh, also with latency. And V over IP, you know, back then was, was even starting to, to be better or quality-wise. And I, I don't think know, they're, for, they're comparable, right? Because, right. the, like, the, the Telos Zephyr is uh, L2 mono 128, 64-bit, yeah. 48K default setting for a mono voiceover send. That's basically an MP3 high quality, really, if you're comparing apples to apples. And um, Source Connect, you know, comparable. But again, we're talking about, you know, voiceover stuff. I don't know if I had recorded jazz sax right, over right. it, you know. Yeah. I got to tell you, like, your mic, you sound fantastic right now. This is a, this is a Rode NT1A. I bought it um, to have a, a podcast mic for home. Um, and I just, I, I, I'm learning it more and more too as I do these webinars. Like it's got the sweet spot. If you talk toward the corner of it, it goes into radio mode. <laughs> if you like talk toward the middle of it. And I like it because it's somewhere between like a 416 and an 87, which is the sweet spot for voiceovers. So all these voice actors that are looking to scramble and make a home studio to get through this and don't want to spend $20,000 on gear because they don't have to, or they might not have enough work to justify it. This thing is two and a quarter with a shock mount and a pop screen. And you get a Scarlet solo and, and use GarageBand with Source Connect and you are, you've got a home studio. Right, right. Um, and my, my whole webinar starts with a, a, your home studio is not a USB mic and a, uh, a laptop. So you know, stop saying it is. <laughs> You know, you need to have the gear, uh, but you don't have to break the bank to do it. And I've put together shopping lists. Like I put together for somebody, let me open it up here, uh, a $200 voiceover booth. I'll show you some of the shit I've been doing for people. Uh, do you want to share your screen or? Yeah, I'm going to share it. Hang on a second. Okay. Crack you guys up a little bit with this stuff. Um, bring up my, oh, host disabled screen sharing. Oh, uh, here I can. You don't know what you're missing, guys. Here, hang on a second. Let me see if I can. I'm so used to being the host that I forgot that they're. I'm going to make you. I'll make you the host. All right. Wow. So, okay. You now have complete control. All right. In, Here's in, what we're really going to talk about. Guys. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll share this. So this is something I put together. 
you take a, it says a $200, wow. actually less than 200. You take a four by four beach canopy for 80 bucks, collapse into a little bag you can shove under your bed, a bunch of moving blankets and some clamps. And then presto, you've got yourself a, a booth. And then I've also made a package. Let me see if I can pull this up here. Wow. Uh, yeah, and it cool. works. I had a guy send me some recordings with it, and I was like, that is fine. It's not soundproof. It's not going to block out a siren if there's a, something going on. And then I put this together for someone today. $485 package. Tech Zone Stellar X2. It's a great Neumann knockoff. The Rode NT1A that I've been referring, it's sold out on Amazon. I'm taking full credit for that. You can't even get them right now. Um, same with the Scarlet Solo. You can't get them on Amazon. But the 2i2 is only a little bit more money. Mic stand, fold-up music stand, portable, removable, battery-powered, clip light, and a pair of headphones. So you take $200 booth, $485 worth of gear, and you've got a pretty banging home voiceover set up for well under $1,000, and you can function in this business. That's awesome. And is that based on GarageBand? Is that what you're saying, too, for the Well, program? they can use whatever they want. Yeah. Everyone's got their favorites. Some people yeah. like Audacity. Some people swear by the... Uh, what's the thing that Adobe charges a bunch of money for? Audition. Audition. People, like, oh, I use that. I'm like, well, why, why would you spend money on a monthly subscription for an audio software? You can get Pro Tools first for free. Mm -hmm. You can get GarageBand, which you probably already have. It's free. Or as the, the guy from Source Connect pointed out, if you're just running a backup during a Source Connect session, open up QuickTime and hit new audio recording and let it roll. I, you don't have to overthink this, but there are a lot of voice actors that are working from home and delivering finished files. So those people need to be able to edit, clean out breaths, EQ a little bit. But so many traps with source kind of, with uh, GarageBand, these templates they make for voice actors, like narration template, oh, yeah. but they put reverb on it and all this shit. Like, well, you don't want any of that. So I'm trying to get them off that. My missions are to get them from using those templates and throw out their Blue Yeti USB mics. Those are my two <laughs> keystone. That's my platform. <laughs> to the Yeti, learn how to use GarageBand. <laughs> That's fantastic. Awesome. That's good stuff. Well, we have a bunch of educators here. Why don't we why don't, you know, talk about some of the pitfalls of this situation in, in education? <laughs> I was just cause based on our conversation yesterday and I, I see, uh, you know, uh, Joe Manamore is on here and other people are teaching. I'm just curious to hear what other people um, are going through with uh, trying to convert audio classes to online classes. I, you know, we've been, I, I teach actually more like a media productions class. So we do like graphics and things like that, but it's just been really hard. Um, I think on the high school level to get kids to in, stay engaged and participate, you know, for a variety of reasons, like kids don't, they don't have it. it this wasn't planned. So nobody has, nobody set up really to, to do it for sure. So it's kind of hit or miss what, what everybody has. And then, you know, I, I'll, I'll be honest with you, if it was April and I was a high school senior, I'd be like, I'm done, you know? So it's hard to get kids to, uh, to really engage. How, what, what's it like on the college level? Well, it's funny because Paul and I were talking about this yesterday. Um, for me, uh, with our audio classes, you know, it's so hands-on. I'm just trying to come up with creative ways to try to get them to just get over the finish line for the next couple of weeks just so that they can pass. But they're, I'd say 50% of the students aren't even logging on to our online platform. You know, um, it's difficult. Paul, you were saying the same thing, right? It's just, just getting them to engage um, with videos and content, you know, to reiterate what you've already taught in the beginning of the semester, it's difficult, you know? Yeah, for me, I mean, I teach uh, several classes. Well, one of the classes I teach is introduction to sound. And then I, I teach a critical listening class and uh, music notation with Sibelius. And Jay is a bricky, like he teaches Pro Tools classes. So he probably has a lot of the same things. Like, first of all, you know, when we teach, we teach out of a computer lab and with, with you know, a Pro Tool station and microphone and every, everything at, at each station. Um, these kids did not come into the semester not necessarily having a computer that's able to run Pro Tools or able to run Sibelius or they didn't have the license. Even if they had Pro Tools first or whatever, you know, the, the classes get deeper than that. So 
Avid has made uh, licenses available to the edu you know education partners so that all the students can have a license. But I don't know. Last I heard, there were some problems with the ILOC solution stuff. Jay, I don't know if that was ever straightened out. Was it? Uh, I'm not sure if it's been straightened out. Uh, the issue I've been running into is quite literally 50% of my students don't have a computer set up that can currently run Pro Tools, at least uh, in a stable uh, way. And it's really starting to slow things down because, you know, you don't want to just teach half the students. And um, it's making it very difficult. Uh, my class in particular, there's two pretty large Pro Tools projects that they do um, throughout the semester that are, you know, a pretty big part of their grade. And uh, now I'm starting to try to think of ways to readjust. Um, but yeah, right now, like I check in with the students, my class meets twice a week. I check in with them three or four times a week. Um, and we're still at the point where it's right down the middle at 50%. 50% can actually run it. And the other half, they're trying. Some kids are trying to order RAM online. Oh, wow. Some kids are trying to they're like trying to find money to maybe get new computers and it's, it's really difficult right now. And I feel for them because they didn't plan for this either. You know, they planned to pay their tuition and come into a computer lab where we provide them with uh, a computer interface, microphones, headphones, everything that they need. And um, you know, they're in a tough spot. A lot of these kids are, you know, pretty broke, uh, you know, college freshmen and sophomores and, uh, yeah, it, we're just trying to figure out a way to keep it going. So I've kind of sh uh, shifted a little bit. I'm doing a bit more uh, lecture and seminar, uh, providing them with very detailed notes, um, things that would have typically been a PowerPoint presentation. Mm -hmm. I'm actually taking that PowerPoint and typing up my entire lecture that I would have done um, you know, into a, a PDF and, and basically just giving them what I would have said and then I hang out online, I answer questions, um, but we're still trying to get over the Pro Tools hurdle at this point. Yeah. Jay, could you set up remote desktop access uh, in your, either at the studio or in your computer lab so the students could just, uh, they could install the, um, and I have a limited knowledge of this program, but um, of these programs, but you can install a program like Remote Control and then um, essentially you, you log in with your computer to the computer that has the programs and the uh, technical capabilities to run what you need to run and then literally just do it remotely. Would that give the students access to it? Yeah, I, yeah, I actually mentioned yeah. that to Joe, our the head of the department, like when this was all going down. But the problem is because it's a, a, a college, you know, we have certain access, like we're, we're kind of like a self-contained in terms of our, our technology, but there's still an, an overarching IT department. Yeah. And they would be the ones that would need to set up, you know, the holes to the firewall for all the students and things like that. And I think, I don't think, I, I don't think Joe ever um, went anywhere with it just because I think he figured it would be such a hassle that they would not be down for that. You know, we've that's also, the first thing I thought of, you know. We've, we've also had problems. We have, we have a bunch of students who don't even have a router at home with Wi-Fi. You know, every, a lot of our students are doing stuff over the phone. So kind of, Jay, what you were saying, what, we're, what I've been doing is instead of doing stuff hands-on, I've been doing a lot of lecture, a lot of videos, and a lot of content creation just to kind of get them over the finish line. Um, but still trying to get them to even log on has is, is been an issue. The good news is for next semester, probably like you, Jay, and Paul, we're going to have a lot of online content to supplement our uh, in-person you know, yeah. in you know, in classes and hands-on stuff. So um, I don't know. It, it's, it's difficult. And I, Joe, I don't know how you, you know, how you're dealing with that, especially if you're doing more media, but it's just getting kids to log on. Yeah. And what you were saying, like, you know, Adobe is offering licenses as well, but it's all got to be done through the school. The kids can't just, you know, sign up for it. So then that's just so far down on the priority list right now that it hasn't, you know, bubbled up. So, but like you said, next year, if we're still in this, everybody's going to hopefully be outfitted with something to, you know, so we're at least have a level playing field. Yeah. One of the yeah. things that I am dealing with in my class, especially, well, intro to sound, you know, we're at the point where it was going to be, let's go to the big room and mic up a drum kit and mic up a piano and experiment with different mics, mic placement, that kind of thing. Well, that 
is no longer an option for them to get their hands on and actually move the microphone and listen, you know, that kind of thing. Or um, how to how to ring out a room, how to you know how to ring out a PA and stuff like that. Like there's there's no, I can I can give them information about it and put, you know maybe demonstrate some stuff or find, curate some videos where they're covering that. But that's not the same thing of them getting the feedback and needing to find that, that frequency on the EQ and notch it out, you know, or, you know, using the real time analyzer. You know, the kids are, are walking around with, with their iPhone, with an app, a free download and you, you get the frequency. I, oh, I know. Concert hall. When, when I'm doing monitors, I, before I get a chance to even reach over to the EQ, my A2 is like, it's 400. Like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that we never would have figured that out. But, but I was gonna say that works except when band when the band's actually playing and you've got like a frequency on the edge. Yeah, because it it'll never show up. You know, it's in the middle of the all of the the meters. Anyway. Yeah. Hey, I had a uh, an aside uh, to you guys talking about the problems that folks are having with Pro Tools. Um, and I thought about this as a suggestion is Pro Tools in and of itself is a resource hog and has never, they've made no bones about ever being an efficient uh, program. Um, I recommended to some kids who were like, my computer could barely run anything. I'm like, find an old version of Reaper. You, first of all, Reaper is free for 60 days. And for those of you that don't know, it's free for every day after that. You just keep clicking, I'm still evaluating. And you can do that forever. And you can go all the way back to like version one is available online. And these things were made for, I mean, you know, stuff that I think steam powered computers. <laughs> and like I, cause I literally have a, a, a white or oh, I threw it out, but I had a white MacBook. Um, uh, it, I don't think it was an iBook. It actually was a MacBook, but, uh, I think it was like a 2008 computer and I was re recording 32 channels on Reaper, you know, with whatever interface while Pro Tools was like, no, you know, like absolutely not. Yeah. That's a great That's suggestion. A it is, except for the fact that like Jay's Zabricki's classes are Pro Tools certif certification classes. Yeah, so. that's unfortunate. Yeah, but, but if yeah. you can get I'll if you can get students working, mm -hmm. like hey, because uh, like someone asked me actually just today, like hey, are you using Pro Tools, and uh, or hey, do you know how to use Reaper? And I was like, eh, it's like me trying to cook left-handed in someone else's kitchen I've never been in. Mm -hmm. um, you know what you want to do, but you don't know where any of the tools are and 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 you're using your wrong hand yeah so i mean that's what it's been for me but at the same time you know the concepts especially for the students that you know that aren't you know if, if they if they're not up to speed on pro tools it wouldn't matter if they're not up to speed on reaper <laughs> yeah cakewalk is also free now that uh, it was a band lab acquired them after mm -hmm. uh it was a gibson killed them off so that's also available for free windows only but that's another free one it's out there too Traction is free. Okay. And I think they changed the name to Waveform or something like that. Still free. Yeah. None of, like you said, none of us know what's going to be on the other side of this. We're not going to be returning to what it was before all this started, I think. Not just in audio, but in society, you know? I don't know what, what that's going to look like. But yeah, right. so it's, it's, it's disconcerting enough as an adult you know, who we, we kind of know where we are in our world and that kind of thing. I can't imagine, like, being a teenager or a young adult is so difficult as it is, but then have this being thrust upon I feel so bad for my children. Yeah, my kids are, oh, oh, go ahead, yeah. They, they find a way. I mean, oh, when I yes. graduated college, uh, a guy who had been doing what I now do, now I graduated and I was not going to do commercials. I was going to be an album guy, which I did for a while. Mm -hmm. But... I was told by a friend of the family very early on, get your real estate license. The recording industry is dead. And that was 1990. And then in 1996, I started my own company. And uh, the headline of one of the ad magazines was television advertising is dead. Right. And then 15 years after that, you know, it's like, it's always dead. It's always the worst it's going to be. But the young people, find ways to reinvent it constantly. You look at, look at YouTubers, look at like, 
TikTokers, like just all this, yep. all these things that they come up with, they're going to take the skills. Now, I, I feel like if I was an educator, my job is to make, just to lay the foundation. This is yeah. the base, the basics of acoustics doesn't change. What I've mm-hmm. proven a hundred times over in the last three weeks of working with voice actors, you can have a great mic and a shitty room. You can have a shitty sound. You can have a shitty mic in a great room. You might have a good sound, but it all works together. And, and you, if you don't have those basics under your belt, signal flow, what the gear does, how to work it, how to edit, then you can't do anything. But if you have that foundation, I mean, look at hip hop, you know, yeah. you'll learn how to like samplers are created with one thing in mind and hip hop flips it on its end and creates a new industry um, that I poo pooed for years until it became my bread and butter. Um, they'll find a way. I don't feel bad for anybody. I think they'll take what they've got and they'll run with it always. You know, yeah, I, wasn't, I was speaking existentially, not, not necessarily career-wise. No, I know. Wise, I know. You know but it's but, every, you know, but, it's, it's been the end of the industry over and over and over again, and yet it still finds new. It might evolve. Sure. Yeah. You know. I think more than, uh, more than anything, it really encourages this growth that we've had towards the whole industry becoming a cottage industry especially when you consider like, for example, Billie Eilish and uh, her production team, which is just her brother, Phineas, they just, they just swept the Grammys and Phineas did this whole interview interview where he said, I don't care if I go to your big studio and it takes 20 minutes for me to get an aux cord. I want to be making a track in 20 minutes. And so with everyone all holed up in their homes and everyone, you know, not being able to go to big studios with boards and everything, people and bands just want like, like, uh, like you were saying earlier, um, Frank, they just want, small systems where like I'm in my bedroom and uh, you know, I have my mic and if I want to, I can plug my guitar into my interface and I could make my record. And then I can take my cheap video camera or my phone and put up a cheap backdrop and do my music video and, you know, do my YouTube channel. And it's like, you don't need to invest. That's what, that's what, especially for me talking to other engineers, my age, it's like, that's what people want. They want like a smaller, more, less, less, less commercially central centralized, and a more like peer to peer kind of thing where you, you maybe just go to someone's house. And uh, I think an unfortunate side effect of everything being shut down is that, you know, we can't pay our mortgages and all that. And, and uh, you know, bigger studios have been closing and closing and it's just coming more and more into like, this is my small space and my specialization. And then you go to one person and they do all that thing or you do all of it at home. And uh, you see that with all the content creation. Now, you know, everyone's putting out these covers, everyone's putting out these little, you know, quarantine quarantine cover and all that and um you know i think that's just that just us being stuck at home encourages that whole produce yourself with your limited budget and i think that's the direction everything's going in nowadays anyway but this is just even pushing it farther along on that track i want to throw something out there does quality matter and i don't have the answer i'm just i think it does but i'm wondering have you guys seen where the end user is more forgiving with the quality that's being delivered by people doing these in home and he's, you know, what is quality, Anthony? (laughs) I think, I think that's genre dependent because I work with a lot of people in hip hop and the aesthetic, the, the aesthetic of rap right now is totally crappy, blown out, distorted, like, just like sounds like it was, uh, it sounds like you mic'd up a boom box that blew out like five years before I was born. And and there's charm to that. There's there's charm to that. And and I think Anthony, I was going to say something very similar we've already been down the rabbit hole of the beginning of the end of quality mattering. Like reality TV has shown people, it doesn't have to be great. It just has to be good enough. Right. And now coming out of this, all my, my fears, my clients are going to realize, well, I mean, we made pretty good stuff on a, on doing to. it this way. Do we, do, do we need to go back to the studio for some things? Yes. But it's, it's a, as, as I say over and over in my little webinars, it's a watershed moment. Yeah. It's, it's like when the earthquake in Japan put an end to videotape very quickly because the factory was gone, uh, everybody quickly went tapeless and it shifted how we all work. Uh, we're about to see that for at least what I do. But quality has been a problem for a long time. Reality TV gets us so used to what I call Frankenbites, where you've got a sentence constructed from four different ambiences and four different days, yeah. and, and people just go, I didn't hear a difference. You know, <laughs> uh, quality hasn't mattered. I've been you know, rallying forever to try to keep quality up. And when I started my career in music, 
uh, rappers would come in and this guy came in with a cassette once for this project and he had all the 808 samples that his friend played him onto a cassette so that I could resample them. And I said, well, wait a minute. I already, I have a whole library of the 808. Why don't I just pull it up? But he didn't want it because he wanted to hear the hiss and the noise from what he had. And I would, as a purist, we're all trained to be, you know, good sound engineers. They don't care. That's not what yeah. it's about. And that carries across everything. I gave a speech and a talk in DC at a, at, a, at a trade show and it was a whole podcasting track. And my topic was content versus quality or my, my presentation because my task in producing Gilbert's podcast was taking him from the kitchen table with one mic and two people and people on the telephone to remote yeah. sync recording two different studios and having it sound like guests are in the same room and really up in the quality but very few people care. A, there's a breaking point in quality where do you start to lose the charm of what it is you're making because you're focused so much on the quality? Absolutely. And I still am, you know, quality first. But yeah. in a pandemic, you, the best you can do is going to have to be good enough. And it's going to have a lingering effect as reality TV has had. We, we, we have lived through this, all of us. I mean, the, the 128 KBS MP3 and that whole trend really hurt the studio industry. Then we had more bandwidth and then quality seemed to make an, a, a comeback. And, you know, now maybe it's ebbing and flowing. I don't know. I just thought it was a good, con, a good you know, um, topic to discuss because people who are going to watch this, quality is an issue. Absolutely. But at the end of the day, a song is still a song. And I, I heard a, st a Stone song on the radio and I'm like, this sounds like shit. But God, it's such a great song. So, exactly. Yeah. I, you know. I don't know. I just thought I'd throw it out there and see you guys, your take was on this, you know? Yeah, and there, but there's a flip side to this too. Almost every actor I've been working with with, a, with their home setup, at some point in their career, every agent told everybody to get the Blue Yeti USB mic. Now, I think the logic was you need something to audition with and instead of having to come to the office, you can do it from home. So good enough, right? Yeah. But now when you're auditioning, I'm not listening so much for the read I'm listening to your quality because my assumption now is what you're sending me as an audition is what I'm going to expect on the day. And that's right, got to right. be good. Um, and I'm trying to, you know, and all the people that have been like, well, my engineer friend told me to get the blue Yeti or so. And it's like, yeah, but they told you a lot of things that are wrong. And then they go out and get a mic like this, which is only a little bit more money really. Uh, and they plug it in and go, Oh shit, that's a night and day difference. I'm like, yeah. So that people understand quality if everybody was on Blue Yetis, commercials would sound really awful right now. Um, and the snowballs and all the other bullshit USB mics that are out there. So, but, but leading them down the path to show them, and then I'll play for them. I'll, I'll screen share Pro Tools and say, here's where we started. Here's where you are. This was you in the corner of your apartment. This is you in the booth that we just made. It's a huge difference, and it matters. So, you know, it's what we're always up against. Yeah, yeah. But it's easier. It's more attainable than ever. I mean, you were saying $200, you get a vocal booth that'll cut it. Even for in the album world, it's like, you know, if you want to make an album, look at the new Sons of Apollo album, Billy Sheehan and Bumblefoot. And it was all Helix. It was all Line 6 Helix. You could have all those guitar sounds for four ninety nine and a plug-in wow. Pro Tools. <laughs> so it's like for uh, in the album world, and at least, if good. you're talking about, yeah. If you're talking about quality, you know, you, you can invest in, in $200 of guitar plugins. You don't have to have the most expensive ones. You could trigger all your drums and all that you need is a nice room for your drums, for the cymbals, and then for the vocals that it's not like a mess. And I think that's how every, everything I think is going to go to that point. Anything that can be DI'd and faked will be, will be DI'd and faked. Like yeah. why, 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 spend, why spend $50 an hour trying to nail my parts in the studio when I could DI it? And then come in with my track and reamp it if I want, or just use my processor, which sounds 99% the same anyway. The only thing you need a nice room for anymore is something that exists in space, you know? Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's like, it's just, I think, I think that's going to be, I think that metal bands are really jumping on that wave right now. Not all of them, but like the gent kids are all jumping on that wave of just plug your computer in, just trigger all the drums. And the only thing we have to worry about is recording cymbals and recording vocals. And it's just like, that's, you know, it's easier budget wise. Does it sound better sometimes? But I think that it's just going to go more and more and more in that way. Yeah, I think it'll go that way and then it'll stop and come back around to the people that are going to say, damn it, I want it to sound like Zeppelin. I want it to sound like a band in a room. There's yeah. always going to be re a reaction to that. Sorry, it, you said Zeppelin. That, right? I, think you, I think you meant Greta Van, 
Greta Van Fleet. Um, Greg, I, I think you're right because we've already, I, you know, since 2000, I think we've seen, you know, we've seen that happen once or twice where people do it at home and then they, they want to go back to the big studio. You know, I was going to get into that before I actually had to leave the room. Uh, I had a little sudden uh, bit of agita that I had to go take care of. Uh, we can keep that for the, for the website. Yeah. Could we please? Uh, <laughs> got me a big glass of milk. Let's go anyway. to the bathroom. <laughs> um, but the, the fact that we were talking about like, you know, this is going to cause everyone to basically have a home recording setup. We, we kind of agree that anyone who's doing this and is going to continue doing this is going to have a home recording setup. But I think everybody already has had something. If they were ever doing anything, they were already using it. Uh, I mean, we're seeing more and more with these like voiceover folks. Um, and then like, say for example, yes, your gent folks, your, your folks that want to do like, you know, your whole band in the box. It's it's gotten easier, but but I mean when we first had the Mackie Adat studio and a pod, like it was like revolutionary. Hey, I don't need to book studio time anymore. And then you find that, you know, it when we can get everybody in the room at the same time, a lot more arrangement things work themselves out quicker. I'll, you know, the the face to face really does work itself out. And so you, you still come back to that. Yes, you can sit and make everything in the box, but something magic happens when you get everybody in the room. Yeah, so absolutely yeah. true. So, hey, I, oh. you know, like this doesn't spell the end of the recording studio. This doesn't spell the end of the big post studio. This just, you know, it, we might take a little more in, of those workflows back to our studios, uh, back to the big studios. Years ago, I used to work on an SSL scenario at this $3 million. It was like we had three identical suites with a scenario and Westlakes. And everybody said Pro Tools would, would bring it all down and be the end of that industry. And they were right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. You know, I was thinking, too, about that, um, you know, like Ethan's point versus, um, you know, talking about like the band getting together in the studio and, it's, I think not only genre specific, but, you know, like as, well, I, I, I wouldn't say I'm an older engineer at this point, but I'm, you know, mid, midway. And, you know, there's a new way of communication that um, younger people are a more, lot more comfortable with and can be, you know, inspired in the same way that maybe I would have needed to be, you know, in the, in the, in the studio with the band and like have that moment. Um, you know, people that are used to communicating this way or used to communicating through gaming online or whatever, and that's how you've grown up, they might get, you know, they might get that same feeling or that same, exp um, you know, experience or inspiration from, you know, this kind of telecommuting kind of thing, you know, I don't know. I just don't think the two have to be mutually exclusive. Um, and yeah, totally. I'm saying that from, from my personal experience, when my band did our last album before we hit the road with Sons of Apollo, we sat down the only we went to a real studio a bunch a guy a bunch of you guys know we went to rich colsar's place uh mono lisa studios i saw a bunch of y'all know him on facebook um, and we did the drums there and then we went to my apartment in new york and we all sat down with our ant modelers i think actually at the time we had real heads and load boxes and we did like the band in the studio hang but it was like my kitchen you know and yeah. and, and headphones but it was the same it was the whole thing um and I hope if we take one thing into like the, uh, the, the pro studio environment versus the home studio environment, it's the convenience of like sitting down, booting up and just like getting right in there. Because I know every time uh, I take a younger person into a quote real unquote studio, they get a little antsy because it takes forever for the computer and the power conditioner to boot up and then Pro Tools has to load and then all the licenses got to go. Through. And it's just like a whole, it's a whole thing. And if they're at, and they, they, they are, uh, convincing themselves their home workflow is better because at home they just have to like plug in the ox and like they've got the juice. So I'm hoping, uh, I, I hope we get a little bit of that injected into, you know, the, the, uh, the bigger spaces because that that's a big thing for the young people. That's why you have the, the second engineer go in and do all that, boot everything up before you walk in. <laughs> What's the yeah, second? You shouldn't be paying for that time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I have a question for Jay Zubricki. Jay, you, you're the resident representative here at GCR, you know, uh, really the premier studio in Western New York. Um, 
you know, I, I know you guys are in the same boat that we are at BlackRock where <laughs> we can't have clients in the room. Um, but I'm also seeing some social media blasts where you guys are still like reaching out for mixed work and remote work. Are you seeing any of that? Is any of that coming back your way or, you know, are the uh, fish biting? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we've, uh, some of our engineers have been getting, uh, some mixed work, some mastering work on the side. Um, you know, we haven't had anybody, you know, any clients in the building since, uh, was it March 20th or 21st, mm -hmm. whenever the first shutdown started to happen. Um, so yeah, we're in the same, same boat as, as pretty much everybody else. But, um, yeah, you know, we, I think we put up one or two posts just about, Hey, if you're working on something at home or if there was something that you started and maybe you want some help finishing it. Um, you know, we've had some people, uh, reach out and it's been mostly like, uh, you know, musicians who have been kind of working on their own album and now maybe want, they have some time to finish it up and they, maybe they're not happy with their own mix and they reach out and they, uh, you know, want to see what um, a professional engineer can do, or maybe it's just mastering. Um, you know, I know one of our guys basically was doing, um, you know, he did like a day's worth of radio edits and uh, you know, there's little things that people maybe didn't have time for before. Um, you know, now they have time to ask our engineers have time to, to do those little edits. Um, but also, you know, sometimes people, are using this time to maybe uh, try to push to get a placement or maybe they need the radio edits for a different reason. Um, so yeah, some of our guys are getting some work like that, but besides that, I mean, it's been, you know, lights off, um, you know, for it's going on almost a month now. Um, so yeah, we're, we're in the same position as everybody else. And uh, you know, it's funny cause right before that, I mean, we uh we had all three studios booked every day pretty much this year and then it just went to a stop just a dead yeah. stop um so it's going to be interesting to see what happens with everything that we had booked uh that was supposed to be coming up next um projects that were in progress and um you know is there going to be a, a flood of people looking to work when the ban is lifted or is everybody going to be broke yeah, that's a good okay. point, Jay. That's a really good point. Yeah. Just don't, we have no, no idea, like no inkling, you know, some of the mixing work and uh, mastering work has led us to believe that people do want to come in and do a record when they can. But um, besides that, you know, we're just hanging tight, um, trying to be prepared for, you know, any direction that we go after this. Um, but yeah, the big question is, are there people waiting to work or is that pool drying up, you know, as people are working less and maybe are having a hard time with unemployment and just a hard enough time with, with living anyways. So, you know, it's, we're just going to sit and wait, see what happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It hasn't come up yet. What our timeline is, you know, for, you know, like when are we, at risk of not even being able to open our doors again because we've, we can't sustain, you know, our, our business without. And, you know, our, our studio was luckily part of a trifecta of other production services, a live venue and whatnot, a couple live venues. And so it wasn't so much that the studio had to kind of pull its weight every month. If it was a bad month, the other businesses could kind of carry the studio a bit, but those don't exist now and there's inevitably going to be a point where a studio is not going to be able to recover you know i i don't know what the timeline is but what gcr look like i mean gcr is a big big facility yeah. you know i mean how long can a facility like that truly sustain you know a blackout really yeah we're trying to figure that out too um you know you know, we're lucky where we have a really great studio manager, um, this guy, Brian Federick, and he, you know, spends time daily keeping his finger on the pulse of, you know, is there any assistance <laughs> coming down the pipeline? Um, if there is, what can he do uh, to try to get a part of it? Um, if there's not, um, it's brainstorming about what can be done. Um, 
you know, but right now everything is just remote. Everything is just kind of, you know, if people want mixes or masters, um, you know, that has been going okay, but that's going to dry up too. Um, especially if it's people who maybe don't have the ability to record at home mm-hmm. or they don't feel comfortable uh, recording at home to get the quality that they desire. Um, you know, sometimes it is like Ethan was saying before, sometimes it, you're, you're doing drums at a professional studio and you're doing guitars, maybe vocals on your own. Um, and then it all maybe kind of comes back together under the supervision of a professional engineer. But what happens when you remove a couple pieces from that equation? Um, some people just can't work or don't feel comfortable doing it. So, yeah, again, you know, we, uh, we meet as a studio, like maybe once a week or so on a zoom call. And, you know, it's fun to maybe get our hopes up and and think about, Hey, when this ends, we're going to come out and we're all going to be back at work. It's gonna be great. But, you know, it's hard to be that optimistic right now. So uh, I'm hiding out in Vermont instead of in uh, hell's kitchen because it's a little bit uh, quieter up here yeah. Yeah, and a lot, le- less a lot less dying. Good for you. That's but, good. Uh, I, on, uh, on March 12th, I was in a session. I had 19 string players on, on a stage because uh, the concert hall I worked at sort of, they got a lot of cancellations because, you know, couldn't have 500 mm-hmm. people assembling, whatever. So we, we, the last week I did a whole bunch of recordings. It was a lot of fun. It reminded me how much... I liked recording sessions versus uh, recording live performances. Mm -hmm. I like recording live performances, but the the session vibe has a a lot more to it. But it it was uh, March 12th. We have 19 string players who all got subs to cover for them on their Broadway shows. And it was the day they announced that Broadway was going dark. So we took a break around... (laughs) three or four in the afternoon and everybody was in this really bad mood afterwards. And I found out why it was like, everybody found out. Yeah. No more work. Wow. And, and, uh, that Monday I came up here. Yeah. My last day of sessions uh, at digital arts was on uh, the 12th. And the last session I did that day was recording just a handful of lines for a Nickelodeon cartoon with an actor named Daniel day Kim. And on the 20th, I got an email from my manager that they just got a call from Nickelodeon's legal department to point out the fact that Daniel Day Kim flew back to Hawaii after that session uh, and then three days later came down with coronavirus and must have had it when he was in New York. So I had a nice little stretch of panic there. It's now, it's a month since I worked with him and I've been <laughs> fine. So you're probably fine. immune. It's good. You probably yeah. fought it. You probably yeah. Good way to look at it. But uh, but I did immediately stop licking the handrails in Penn Station because uh, that was making me nervous. Well, I I kind of half worry and half don't because you know it's, my daughter's twelve now. When she was two or three, I actually had to say, "Please stop kissing the subway." Yeah. <laughs> so she she probably built up immunity. Yeah, she's set. Yeah. It's like the George Carlin routine where he swam in the East River growing up. He's immune to everything, right? Yeah. <laughs> and then he died. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. That's the city version of eating sand in the uh in the uh sandbox. Yeah, there you go. Which my youngest kid was really good at. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I mean coincidentally you guys are talking about, you know, your last days mm-hmm. and whatnot. Um I I, I split my time between a couple of different uh, places, ABC Television, uh, University of Rochester, Eastman School of Music, and uh, and just a local bar uh, mixing bands on weekends. And, you know, within the span of a day, all of that dried up. You know, we uh, the school had gone away on... Um, uh, the Eastman School had gone away uh, for <laughs> spring break and basically never came back. And yeah. on the return from spring break, I was supposed to do the spring opera. I was supposed to mix the, uh, the, the live sound for the spring opera, which is, for me, about 100, 120 hours over three weeks. 
Um, and in between that, I was supposed to do some work uh, at The View at ABC, uh, mixing um, Broadway, a Broadway uh, guest act. And all of that canceled like all at once. And then I have another gig that's supposed to be happening next month, you know, at the beginning of the month. And that, you know, I, three weeks ago, I got a, a cancellation on that. Um, so the first thing I did was, you know, I mean, I got all that news like on a Friday and on Monday, I just applied for unemployment. And I was like, everything's gone. It's all gone completely. I mean, rug pulled out. So, and it's, you know, I, you know, there are a lot of people where, where that's like, no, I have, I, my income comes from like three or four or five different income streams. And yet they all got cut off. It's not like, oh, well, you know, I'm going to spend, you know, half my time, you know, sanitizing masks or something like those people aren't really hiring. Jay, I know you, you work with a lot of, uh, a lot of heavy bands who spend a lot of time on the road. Um, at GCR, do you have you heard anything from those fears? Uh, yeah, I mean, unfortunately, um, literally everything so far has been either completely canceled. Um, I saw one tour is literally getting. I, I'm not trying to laugh at it, but it's literally getting moved exactly one year later. Um, and I thought I was misreading the uh, the tour flyer wrong. So I'm like, wait, these dates seem awful familiar. Um, but the only thing that was different was the year. And, um, you know, that it's kind of scary. Um, a lot of the bands I work with, they make their living on touring. Um, and a good amount of them don't have jobs when they come home. You know, they just, they tour a lot when they're home, you know, they find other stuff to do. Um, but they're, mm -hmm. they're road dogs and that's how they're promoting their albums. Um, that's how they're selling you know, they'd sell some music online, but like when they go on tour, you know, they're selling a lot of vinyl on the road. You know, when they, when they play their shows, um, a band I just did an album with had their album come out at the beginning of January and they sold out of the complete first press by the end of January and got a second pressing in time for their tour that was supposed to start, I think it was March 13th and the entire tour got canceled so, um, you know, luckily for them, their label footed the bill for the vinyl, but I mean, that, that hurts the label now. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, it's really, it's trickling into all different areas of the industry because if these artists and bands can't work, um, you know, that affects if they have a label, management, their booking agent, the venues where they were supposed to play, all the way down to the people who work the door. Um, you know, everybody, uh, is getting affected by that. And, um, you know, I know everybody at, at sports spins is, is feeling this, you know, firsthand with not being able to have the shows and, and host the acts that were supposed to be on tour. But, um, from my side of it, yeah, like the bands that I work with that rely on touring, um, right now, you know, they're doing exactly what everybody else is and they're trying to collect unemployment and, um, you know, but to take a year off or a year plus, you know, from a band that's supposed to be dropping an album, I don't know what that's going to do. I really don't. And I have a couple albums slated to come out later this year, you know, end of summer, early fall. And it makes you wonder, are they even going to come out? Because if they can't promote them, is it worth it? Yeah, thanks, okay. everybody, for, uh, for joining in. It was great to see everybody. Good to put some oh. names to faces. Yep. Where's the other yeah. one? So the guys that like didn't talk, talk at all, Brad, I don't know if Dan, Dan's not on anymore, but it was good to have you with us. Good to Paul. be here. Good to be here, Paul. <laughs> all right. All right, guys. Thanks a lot. Thank I'll wrap it up.